Now for those of you who don't know me, I'm Neville Jobson from Abacus Bio, and I'm going to give you an update on the Silmeet module, which um, hopefully you're, you're all at least familiar with what the, the Silmeet module is. Sil, um, it's the, the module inside Sil where we evaluate the meat trait. So it's for it basically terminal sire performance, but dual purpose animals are evaluated through it as well. So it's where we measure um, the weight of meat, the weight of fat, the meat quality that isn't a specific meat quality module within SIL yet. So when there is a breeding value for intramuscular fat, this might be the right module to put it in. Just to give you um, a little bit of a background so you are um, familiar with what's in there, um, it's our description, our current description of carcass merit. And um, we can't really, de our definition of merit really depends on our position in the value chain. So I, we're mostly breeders here, you sell rams, but a commercial farmer, they buy one of your rams and then they'll sell a lamb at a certain live weight, aiming to achieve a carcass weight, but it's a live animal that goes off their property. So in a way, they breed, they sell a lamb at a certain live weight. The meat processor, they buy that, but what they actually purchase is the carcass, that's what the, the farmer gets paid for, and some of them sell carcasses, but the majority of them will process them a bit, break them down and sell um, some cuts that go out. And so there's, there's a, um, there's a yield that happens going from live animal to carcass weight. There is also a yield going from the carcass to the cuts that are recovered. Then the retailer, they buy those primal cuts and they will further process them down into consumer ready packages. And so there's once again an efficiency that happens there and they'll present them in some way that they hope will attract a customer to pay a reasonable amount of money. And our consumer comes along and they'll buy a retail cut and they'll have expectations about price and eating quality and value and all sorts of things, colour. Um, and so the important thing is that those are not perfectly aligned. So the, the consumer traits, while they're of interest to all of us as breeders, they're not things that we're directly paid for, so in a way it's difficult to incorporate those into breeding objectives. But they're important if we're going to keep the industry going as a very high value, um, value trade. So at the moment, the SIL definition covers the farmer and some of the meat processor expectations about carcass merit. In the future, it may move further down the chain, especially as new technology comes along that allows you to measure some of those consumer traits on an um, animal by animal basis. Um, so, in order to achieve this, there are a whole heap of things that farmers are currently using to measure this. So, I'm sure almost all of you are uh, familiar with ultrasound, so we've got a, an ultrasound scanner up here, it's got a probe, our sheep, this is uh, done on farm, our sheep just stands in a cradle here, and it has um, met the, the eye muscle dimensions, the width and the depth, and the weight, amount of fat over the top that's measured, and you can measure hundreds or even thousands of animals in a day on the property that they come from. Other measurements that we can include, um, meat processor grading systems. At the moment, the only one that SIL is um, actually able to do inside the SIL genetic engine is Viascan, which is the system that Alliance use. It's a video-based system. There's basically a, a lighting box here. They go in, there's a video camera, and it collects a video image of that carcass, and it estimates from that the weight of meat and the hind leg, loin, and shoulder. Um, but um, Progressive Meats has a system here, the Merrill system, which they break the carcass down and measure the tray, um, measure the cuts that come out of it. Silver Fern Farms has been working on a DEXA system, an X-ray system. So there are a number of other systems, and the intention is that all of those systems will ultimately be able to go into SIL so that the breeders are able to work with their meat company, slaughter some animals and get the results back, and that can go into giving breeding values for rams. And at the very expensive end, we've got CT, a CT scanner. So there are three of these that are uh, located around the, the country. One is down at Invermay, that's the one that I work with, but there's also one at Lincoln University and another one at Massey. And so CT is incredibly accurate, but they're really expensive machines to buy and maintain. So um, there are not many people that there's increasing measurement and less pe substantially less people use these technologies than use these. So just to explain that diagrammatically, if we've got a continuum here of increasing measurement accuracy, and at the far end there we've got what's actually true, what, what's actually in the carcass, the actual weight if you sat down with a scalpel, paid someone um, minimum wage to cut up and, and uh, end up with a pile of meat there, <laughs> bone and fat, that's true. 
Where do our measurements sit? Well, we can predict it with live weight, and live weight's really cheap to measure, just run the animals over the scales. The problem is, it's way down this end. So we can predict the weight of meat, but we're missing out on a lot of information. If we do ultrasound, we can substantially improve that. So ultrasound, we're measuring actual meat and fat inside the carcass, so that moves us along in this direction. The actual, the all I'm showing is relative positions. I could give you accuracies, but it's not too important for the actual accuracies, but it's not too important for this discussion. The meat processor system, all of the meat processors that have developed it have done their own calibrations, but that's commercially sensitive. So they're paying on it, they've done the work, they believe that they are doing a um, substantially better job than um, they're being they think they're up at this end, and so that's where we've got them sitting. Live animal CT is possible, it's not perfect, but it's, it's down that far end. And so they, that's sort of the lie of the land, but the problem is that it, along with increasing measurement accuracy, we've got increasing cost. So it costs you just a bit of time to measure live weight. Ultrasound is around about $5 an animal. It just depends on who's doing your scanning and what traits you measure. But let's just say for argument's sake, that's, that's $5. CT, we're talking about $300 an animal to have them evaluated. Now, if you've got the right um, system set up to capture that, that's worthwhile, but there's very, that there are not many people that, that have the scale and the ability to capture that. So we've got, um, so the number of animals that are measured as we go from left to right here diminishes quite a lot. But there, but there are ga substantial gains to be made if this is done, if this is done well. Now, SIL has been running since 1999 as you heard and it's had a meat module the whole time. But here's the problem, when, it was, um, when we started off, we had this meat. It was based on live weights and ultrasound, which was the technologies that we had at that day, and that was great. Underneath it all, we need some numbers we call genetic parameters. And those genetic parameters for that were provided by an experiment that was done by Dan Waldron. I don't know if that name means anything to anybody here. But it was done in the late 1980s. It was done on Romney and Romney Cross progeny. They were 13.6 kilograms carcass weight, and they had an eye muscle size that was about the size of a small 20 cent coin. With a fat cap, with a lovely, um, good, uh, I think the average, GR wa uh, the average GR was around about 12. So, very, yeah, my, the, the, <laughs> they're the kind of chop that my father looks for when, um, when he's doing the shopping, and he had a heart attack at 58. So. <laughs> So our industry is very different from that now, and so that was what it was based on. Um, there was a lot of interest in, in CT in the early 2000s. I came back from Norway and that was what I was working on. Um, we did, and we, um, Chris was CEO of, of Landcorp at the time, and they invested in uh, a CT scanner. And so we produced a module inside cell called CT Meat. Now the internals of that, the numbers, the maths were very similar to the meat module, but we had CT data that was in there. So breeders that were using CT, whoops, used this one, and breeders that were not using CT used this one. Two sets of BVs, two modules you had to request for whichever one. We continued doing development work on CT, and so um, we produced the inner value service and basically the difference with it is it gives you the three main primals because meat is, that the value of meat depends on where it sits in the carcass. The loin is worth a lot more money per kilogram than the hind leg and the hind leg is worth more than the shoulder. So we broke that down. We did some work around that to get some new parameters but we're still largely being driven by this data that came from the 1980s. Um, the meat processors were all working on grading systems. The central progeny test, um, which I'm not going to say much about that today because there's a whole session on it tomorrow morning and I don't want to steal the thunder of those people who are speaking, but the central progeny test alliance were a partner in that initial one. They were very interested in it because they had a new grading system via scan, so the animals were via scanned and over time we were able to build up a large number of animals so that we could actually include via scan so that farmers, breeders could send their culls to the, to the meat processor and they could get data back that would help them to evaluate their rams. But here's the issue. We've got four separate modules that are all meat modules. Some, some breeders are only doing ultrasound, some are doing CT, some are doing CT and ultrasound. Four different sets of breeding values, four different indexes, 
all ranking animals slightly differently. And so it was terribly confusing for them. So there was a lot of feedback that, you know, wh which one do I use and how do I do it? So in 2010, we merged those into the CT Meat Super Module. And so basically the premise was that we take all available data, we put it in there, and we predict one set of breeding values, we have one index. And that's hopefully going to stop um, the animals re-ranking. Uh, between, but the, so we've got one index, but the problem is that the core data at the bottom of it is still being driven by our 1980s Romneys with their little 20 cent law, um, eye muscle, 20 cent coin sized eye muscle areas. Now they were scaled up to be relevant for the carcasses of today, but, the, and these experiments are horrifically expensive to do, but, um, when beef and lamb genetics came along, there was the opportunity to finally revise things. Uh, once in about 30 years seems to be about normal for other industries around the world, and that seems to be about what we've uh, done. So we've got a one in 30 year chance to revise those and make them relevant for the mix of breeds that we have today and for the carcass sizes that we have. So we do what scientists do, and we did what's called a power-based assessment to determine how many sires we, we had to do. This is a really expensive experiment, and it's chewing up a lot of the BLG's finances. The original experiment had 105 sires. We figured we could do it with just a little bit less and still get a result that would work, and uh, hopefully last 30 years before it gets uh, done again. And so the magic number is that we needed around about 80 sires that were representative of the industry at today's carcass weights, and aiming to try and get up to about 10 progeny per sire. And what we wanted to do on these core animals was to measure on, exact, on the same group of animals, ultrasound, or get a live weight, ultrasound scan them, live animal CT scan them, send them to Alliance and get a via scan measurement, and then send them, get some measurement of the truth. And for what's actually in there. And for our measurement of true, we sent them back to the CT scanner and we scanned the entire carcass, sampled the whole thing, and that gave us an incredibly accurate estimate of how much meat there was in each of those three cuts. So that was our true. In addition, um, there, are, there is probably elements of carcass value that our straight numbers don't, don't measure. So there I'm, I'm admitting that as a sire. You might remember in the, in the as a scientist, sorry, the, uh, in the 1990s, <laughs> as a sire, <laughs> Freudian slip there. <laughs> in, the, in the 1990s where ultrasound came along, there was criticism that the animals with straight selection for leanness was producing these big slabby framed animals. And we've come away from that and Alliance's market choice initiative was to address that the animals were getting too big. They wanted them better finished and a bit more compact. So, you know, what you guys have known, we're acknowledging that and saying in the, in the latter part of the program, we've got the numbers tidied up, there's some room there to actually go through and try and address some of those issues. So that's part of the program. Now, this is the perfect world. This was the program as we uh, intended to have it. You might be familiar with it. That's the, that's the world where lamb sells for seven or eight dollars a kilogram live. Um, <laughs> so what we were gonna do was, um, and we need 80 sires, so in year one, which was 2014 and 15, evaluate 40 sires. Do a next 40 sires, remember measuring these for ultrasound, CT, and via scan, and then we would have our 80 sires collected. We'd be ready to re-estimate out the numbers that we need to drive it to replace those 1980s Romneys, and we would be able to add one grading, or an, a grading system that wasn't via scan. So we would, we would uh, go and speak to the meat processors and see who was willing to um, come in and be a part of that. The next year, some tidy up things, but the main work program was add yet another grading system. And in the last year of the program, inv investigate some of those shape and muscularity um, things. So that, that's with the best of intentions, that's what we set out to do. So where are we? Well, just for reference, there's our, there's our ideal world. We have got basically to the end of our blues. So the blues are where we are at currently, and this is what we're going to do um, to finish the program. So we didn't have the money to go and generate these animals, so what we did was we went to um, stud breeders and asked for some of their culls, for stud breeders that had a large number of rams, and a number of stud breeders were very willing to coll uh, collaborate with us and supply those animals, but they were harder to get than we anticipated, and also beef and lamb was still genetics, has to allocate resources, and it was also a bit expensive to do it over two years. So it was, um, it was thinned down, so we did 23 in the first year, 21 in the next year. Just with resourcing, um, we're down to 20 this year. 
that leaves us 20 to do next year to finish it and so this time next year we will be doing the actual estimation of the variance components which we'd hope to basically be, be doing, have, be, have done now and have ready. Now the part of that was resourcing but also some opportunities came up and one of those is that the opportunity to bring the progressive meats system, marrow grading system in came up. And so Amy has been, uh, Amy has been running the um, Horizon Farms Next Generation site and I'm not going to spend much time on that because there's a whole session on the, on the CPT, but there was the opportunity to bring their system in. So in year two, we got 150 carcasses that were killed at Progressive, we trucked them to Massey, we did a complete sampling of um, the carcasses with CT and then we sent them back to Progressive and they went through their grading system. So we calibrated their system. Then. Um, the animals from the Horizon Farms progeny test were slaughtered the following year. Now, the problem is to integrate that system, we need this data. We can't do that properly until we get to here. So this year we've had to provide research breeding values for them. They look that they're basically the same breeding values um, as are supplied for Viascan, but um, so they're, they're the same trait description, but they've come from data from Progressive. We have some more work to do to put that into SIL, and we have to wait for that. So it's probably going to be two years of um, providing research BVs to the farmers for that. That's just uh, so. We're on track to deliver the whole program by the end of the five-year period. That's the important thing. We've had to reshuffle things just due to. Um, being able to resource, to find animals to resource the project and some other opportunities that have come to let us get ahead in other areas. So where are we at? Um, so just very quickly, 23 sires in the first year, 21 in the second, 20 in the third year, so we've got 64 to date, 509 progeny. These are the core progeny that have been measured for all of those traits. So that's ultrasound, live animal CT, via scan and dead animal CT, carcass CT. And so um, in next year we'll ha have completed that work and we'll be ready to do our analysis. But the, f the flocks that we got those rams from have been very um, kind and they've allowed us to reach into their flocks and get any data that they've collected. So while they haven't done much in the way of CT, there is a massive amount of um, weaning weight, live weight, eight, ultrasound measurements. So in the data set that we've got to date, 124,000 um, winning weight records, uh, 100,000 live weight eights, lots, about 50,000 eye muscle area measurements, eye muscle dimensions. Because this is, um, the CPT comes into this, we've got a lot of via scan, and some of these have actually um, done some CT scanning as well. The ones where we're short, and this is the bit that's holding us back, is it's our measurement of true um, so bringing those carcasses back and doing the detailed scanning on those. So we've only got 300 of those that we're building up to, our, to the number of animals that we needed. I'm going to put up, yes I am, I'm going to put up um, a table now that has lots of little numbers. The numbers are, are relevant, uh, so don't, <laughs> don't gasp too much. So this is, <laughs> this is variance components that we've estimated out, and these are for our true ones. So these are, we, we've only got 300 animals for that. So what we've got here is fat, lean and bone in the hind leg, the loin, the shoulder and the flap. And so these bottom numbers here are the numbers that we need in order to do our evaluations. Don't worry about the numbers. We've got these red NEs, non-estimable is what it means. So we don't yet have the data in order to be able to estimate that out. So these were done at the halfway stage. We built the model so that when we have the data, we should be able to be very quickly get out those variance components and do it. And for the ones that we can estimate, look at this one here, That's uh, this is the error, that's 25%. We want to see that certainly under 10% and hopefully less than 5%. So we've, we've done um, an initial analysis, so our models are ready. When we add that additional data, that will bring fill in those red spots and our errors will come down to the level that it's acceptable. We'll have faith in our, our, the breeding values that we're doing and, and we'll be able to implement that. So we're on track um, and we're, we're basically set and ready to go when, um, when the last of the data is in. Part of this, as I said, was to include new meat processor grading systems. And so um, the, first, the first point that I have to make is we all talk about yield. What is yield? If I asked and got definitions around here, 
Some people would agree, some people would disagree over what it is. Yield is simply something divided by something else, and the something else is normally something that's bigger. So in the alliance system, the yield figure that they give is the kilograms of lean or, or meat from the hind leg, loin and shoulder as a percentage of carcass weight. In the progressive system, 100% is the weight that they expect to get from that carcass weight. So if it's more than that, it might be 105%. If it's less than that, it might be 95%. So here I am, an alliance breeder, very happy for the fact that I just got a kill sheet that has 62%, and I tell that to my progressive meats sub friend, and he says, 62%, that's crap, mine are yielding at 94 <laughs> They're not talking. One's, talk, one's speaking German and one's speaking French. So what we have to do is that we have to take whatever data they're producing out of their system and turn that into a common language inside cells so that we can give the same ranking. Now, we've got lots of things that are, we've got CT and Viascan already doing this, so that seems to be the, um, the thing to do, that our traits are going to be the weight of meat in the hind leg, in the loin and the shoulder, weight of fat in the total carcass and carcass weight. We want to limit the number of traits because this is it, this module is one of the biggest in cell and we have to make it so that the computer can still solve that. Um, we need to calibrate each system relative to our, dead, our carcass CT, so spiral CT, our most accurate measure, and then we'll scale um, the, all the different systems, we'll scale for the accuracy. Now, the accuracies are confidential, we're not SIL knows what they are for all the different systems, but th that information has been provided in confidence, um, and so it will be treated appropriately so that we get the right spread of breeding values for the system that the animals have been graded through. So just um, for those of you who, um, the, the, the progressive system is quite different to the types of systems that other meat processors are, have or are working on. Most of them are using video or x-ray to take the whole carcass and look at that and, and estimate out how much meat and fat are in it. Progressive system does it so that they split the carcass, it comes along a conveyor belt and it drops into this bin here. This boner has a little screen here that tells him how to further process that. He does that work and he drops the different cuts into these different bins and then he hits a button, it drops those all weighed and then they're carried off. And, uh, and then he does the next part and those are weighed and they're carried off. So, so the progressive system measures the actual weight of saleable meat that he gets back which includes in some cases bone because a, a French rack has bone and it includes fat. So we've calibrated it so that, it, that we know we can predict out how much meat um, and bone in the different meat, fat and bone are in the different cuts, so that they're speaking the same language and we can deal with that. Um, so we do have breeding values for the morale system. In the original um, program, we didn't actually, int we, we didn't intend to ever have those as kind of a little orphan, but because the opportunity came to do it and we can't um, incorporate that into the SIL system until we have the, the full program finished, um, Amy spent quite a bit of time in the, in the um, progressive plant this year evaluating 800 progeny. We've um, come up with a research BV at the moment, which is the same traits, the weight of lean in the hind leg, loin and shoulder, but it's called the progressive meats version of that. It may not be, the, so the spread of the BVs, the scale of the BVs might not be exactly the same, it won't be exactly the same as they appear in the final thing, but the animals should rank similarly. So it gives the breeders that, are, that have supplied rams into the Horizon Farms um, a result that they can work with, but the BVs may look different by the time that they get back. The, the rams won't rank um, very differently, but, um, but it's something that they've got so that they, they get a result out of that. My final slide is just um, muscularity is sort of at the very end once we've done all of that, and so this is um, those of you who, who know Mark Young, Mark was um, always very passionate about trying to um, come up with some descriptors of shape because he is aware that the shape of the animal is also important as well as how much meat that you can get off. So there are people that believe that our current grading systems don't capture all of that carcass value um, and so there's the opportunity here. We know that we can change the shape of animals based on selection, and so that, that big slabby animal that we were producing in the early days of ultrasound is an example of that. We do need some meat processor input 
you know, because otherwise we're just guessing um, to a degree what is actually, what's a good shape, and how do you describe that? Um, because I don't know, I know there are some people here that were reliant suppliers, and in the early day of, of market choice, in their mind they had a very good description, but it was always described with, we want a lot of meat here. So, and there was, there was some hand-waving to demonstrate that, but how do you actually translate that into something that you could measure from, for example, a CT image? So we've got a great data set that we can look and try and um, put some benefit onto that.